The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back. Cardinal Baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. The co-hosts are here, Gene Hutmaker and Alan Blumpkin. Um, we have a very special guest that's coming on. His, he's a fanatical Cardinal fan. He was a guest recently on Mark and Mark um, with Mark Littell and Mark Weiss, Mark, Mark and Mark in the Midday. Um, he's got a, a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. Um, life has dealt him kind of a, a rough blow. He's been um, been very, very seriously ill, and um, I'm glad he's uh, around yet another week. It's that serious. So um, he's about to dial in, I'm sure. Um, he's been waiting for this all week, and we just spoke recently. Um, let's talk. Uh, first, welcome, Gene. And welcome, Al. Yeah, did, did you guys last week discuss at all Wally Moon? No, we didn't. Yeah, he passed away uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, I remember him most as the Dodger. Most uh, people remember him most as the Dodger. But uh, I have his book uh, they came out with several years ago called Moon. And uh, one of the things he revealed in there was when he came up as a rookie with the 1954 Cardinals for the first part of the season, he was heavily booed at home because he was replacing in a slaughter in the outfield. Right. Uh, so he overcame that to be rookie of the year. You know, that, was, uh, that was the first time the Yankees got in a slaughter, am I correct? Right, yeah. What and, was behind uh, that and what were you thinking? Well, it was 37 years old and at the time. Me. He was dealt yeah. at the time he was well, dealt to the Yankees. 37 I going on 38. I Gene was thinking, yeah. Yankee, Gene Gene, the Yankee-hating machine, when one of his fav- favorite Cardinals all of a sudden became a Yankee. And what he had a good year in 53. Passion? He had a good year in 53 also. Yeah, there's 37 going on 38, and I guess you know, the Yankees had sold the Grashy to the Cardinals a couple of weeks before. You know, Slaughter was traded there. And one of the farmhands... Well the, yeah, yeah, one of the... Far, yeah, one of the farmhands that the Yankees sent to the Cardinals in the Slaughter deal was Bill Hart. Oh, really? Yeah. Who became uh, rookie of the year in 55. Yeah, and then uh, Frank Wayne gave him to the Pirates for Bobby Del Greco and Dick Littlefield about a month into the 56 season. Uh, well, that worked okay. out well for me in 1960. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Wayne was a disaster as a general manager for yeah, the uh, uh, well, Cardinals and with the good. Indians, yeah. All about himself. Yeah, oh, yeah. He, he couldn't stand any player that... Uh, and any team he was on that was more popular than he was. Yeah, he tried to treat like I think boy bones because uh, for a while there he had a pretty good reputation. I think. With the White Sox, because he, you know, he built the White Sox up in the fifties, but then he went to the Card- White Sox. He went to the early fifties. He went to the Cardinals, and then they, you know, trade changed East in '56, and he tried to trade Musio. That was the end for him there, and then he went to the Indians. Built up a team that came in second to the White Sox in '59, and just as quickly, uh, you know, broke it up, culminating with the Calavito trade. And you've mentioned before that uh, what irked uh, Trader Lane was that Calavito was getting more press than he was. Well, Musial was more popular than him. Shaney's was more popular than him. Wh- whoever it was, I didn't think trading Shaney's. Because he was getting up there was a bad idea, bad idea, but he rejuvenated his career, if not with the Giants, with the Braves, and he gave the Braves several decent years at second. Yeah, he made well, a run of basically, they, 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 basically they traded him uh, Thousand Dark. You know, it was an eight-player trade, 
And of course, one of the players involved with that was Dick Littlefield, who uh, uh, was in, uh, you know involved in almost every trade <laughs> in the 1950s. But, right, uh, that's almost sort of Jackie story. Robinson, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So the, the Giants were so thrilled that they got him back when that trade was void that they shipped him to the Cubs a month later. <laughs> but uh, Alvin Dark basically was the key for uh, uh, for Shaney's, and Alvin Dark was a year older than Shaney's. And he didn't really do well with the Cardinals, did he? The Dark went to the Cardinals. He played third base, and they put the Gene's favorite, Kenny Boyer, in center field. 1957, and then Casco Casco was third. Ca- yeah, yeah. Doc Boyd, yeah, and then they shifted. They sent Doc uh, early in the '58 season to the Cubs for Jim Brosnan, straight up. Ah, oh, that um, I remember Brosnan and Henry and Brosnan's great books. Yeah, describing what it was like to be a big league ball player. Yeah, and, but he hated Sally Hemus, so, who. Uh, Managed the Cardinals for a couple of years. Yeah, and uh, ironically, his pitching coach with the Cardinals was a fellow by the name of Marv Grissom, who um, was Uncle Marv, the old uh, giant, yeah. whom I got to know when he was a rover um, in the Northwest League for uh, for the A's or. I think it was the A's back then under Bill Rigney. Um, and he was a great guy. I got to know him, and we'd communicate and talk every Thanksgiving. He was Uncle Marv to this old giant giant fan, and he would tell me stories, um, one about the aforementioned Alvin Dark and what an incredible hypocrite he was in life and how – and this is coming from a God-fearing Christian person himself, he could not understand Alvin Dark's blatant uh, blatant hypocrisy, the way he lived his life, as opposed to um, his teachings and his, um, his way about him. Um, but Alvin Dark was the key to. He was my boyhood hero. as a short. Yeah, he was. He was a very. Uh, he was an excellent ball player. Absolutely. And Mark Griffin was and, the hero of the 1954 game one, because after the great catch by Mays, Dobie was on third base with one out, and then Griffin came in and Little told him, "Told him I got my guy." <laughs> and and uh, then he said he done little he got some. Right, he got they they po- uh, poked it to uh, strike out, and then he got Hegan on a uh, pop up with Dolby a third. Yeah, in the fact, they got Don in. Little in the Antonelli trade, and they sent him to the Cardinals in the Shaney Stock trade. And it, isn't it interesting? On the Willie catch, he threw that. It was a great catch, but the throw yeah. was even more spectacular. He kept uh, he got Rosen to scatter back to first base kept a double play in order. It was just um, Willie was Willie. Every every show I do, it seems, we're, I'm either talking about Jackie Robinson or Willie Mays. He was just uh, everybody's idol, uh, both of those guys, when you stop to think about it. Um, My sister's favorite that. was Willie Mays. We used oh, to really? argue about Mutual and Mays all the time. Yeah. Um well, Stan had That's ten years on you. on May. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's right. And you know who Mays's hero was? Was Joe DiMaggio. Joe oh, Willie always acknowledged Joe being the greatest of all time in modestly, and he wasn't a modest man, but he um, certainly took his hat off to Joe. Well, the Yankees had a, you know, a contemporary that wasn't too bad named uh, Mickey Mantle. Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. Mm-hmm. I, think, <laughs> I think it crosses my mind. Um, you know, it's incredible. His, his stuff, anything with his picture on it, sells for, still sells for a ton of money. It's unbelievable. You know I've been dead for 20, 22 years, and his stuff still is, uh, you know, people pay through the nose for his stuff. Oh, 
Absolutely. And his card, I don't know if it's uh, what it is, but his 52 card tops. Yeah, that was goes a, uh, so much more money than yeah. does Willie Mays's. Yeah, because Mantles was in a, the high series, which didn't uh, get distributed to uh, to the summer when most kids were over in, either in school or camp, in the camp or traveling or whatever. And uh, Topps, a uh, bunch of years later, dumped uh, they had a ton of these cards in their warehouse. They dumped them in the Gowanus. Right. Well, and the yeah, mantle was this, 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 on, on on rafts or whatever they. Yeah, were the going. mantle was the. Bar, the uh, yeah. Jackie Robinson was in that set. It was taking up space. Yeah, there. Jackie Robinson was in that set camp. And now we're Pee Wee A whole Reese. bunch of Hall of Famers. Yeah, a bunch of Hall of Famers in that set. The, the, Joe Blow goes for for, for three, four hundred. I, I yeah, I know, yeah. The high numbers forget. That I just put together that set, minus Fury 6. No. So you were saying together. you put together the 58 set, too. My favorite. We talked about that on Facebook. Uh, the, the 52 I, I have is the repost. It was so inclusive. I think yeah. the 58 set had a higher percentage of players that actually played that year for the team that the card is issued to than any other set. Um, well, you know, just, Topps and uh, Bowman competed until uh, Topps bought them out for, in time for the 56 set. So there, when during the war there, there were players who uh, would appear in one and not the other. So if you caught in one, there's certain players you couldn't get. Like there's no 54, 55 Topps mantles. Yeah, I've yeah, and, and some guys had Bowman cards and Topps cards. Yeah, the, I, I've done a study of that. The only two prominents that were on all, and all the sets on both sides were uh, Yogi and Phil Rizzuto. And you know what? There was um, one guy that Cy Berger uh, talked about in one of his interviews that looked Cy Berger right in the eye and said, are you signed with, with Donruss? And Cy had a copy of the contract that Garogiola signed. Yeah, with Bowman, yeah. And um, he just he lied to him for the money. Is it is just the way <laughs> the way Tops was paying these players so little. So Tops was paying like the cool. They got five years of Ted Williams from fifty four through fifty eight because they pay them four hundred bucks a year. The, one of the only ones that yeah. uh, that they paid yeah. more to than everybody else. <laughs> Tops prided themselves in paying everybody the same amount. Yeah. And um, once the unions came in and they realized what a profit trading cards were making, um, they made it part of the, the bargaining agreement that uh, part of the deal that Tops gave up a hell of a lot of, a lot of profits, but um, there was a lot of money to be given away. Tops. Uh, it was it was almost a fluke that it caught on, and what we talked about with the barges and getting rid of these cards that established the rarity. Yeah, of the, of the fifty-two high numbers. The only reason I've been able to get those is because I bought the re, a few of the reprint sets, you know, which is smaller than the the, the, the you know the real ones, and you could never. And your wildest dream passed one, any, any one of them off for a real one. Ah, okay. I understand that Jerry is on the line, and he we're talking about things uh, that are what he says before my time. Jerry, welcome. Thank you. How y'all doing? All now? right. Um, you made a star appearance on Mark and Mark on this network, <laughs> and we come to find out you're a terrific uh, uh, Cardinal fan and a yes, new sir. grandpa. Congratulations, oh, yeah. Jerry. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, he's, he, he's something else. He was 6 pounds and 12 ounces. Wow. Whoa. Well, but a Cardinal really nice. house. It, Brand new, brand new Cardinal fan. I'll make sure of that. All right, all right. Are you originally from St. Louis, Jerry? How did you get to be a Cardinal fan? Uh, no, sir. I, I live about three and a half hours uh, south of St. Louis, but 
this I mean if this is if you know anything about Cardinal baseball, this is Cardinal country uh pretty much the whole state except for over by Kansas City. Uh uh, Jerry, you want to tell me I, about your first Cardinal game? Who took you, and uh, who was your uh, who was your favorite player growing up? Okay, my uh, I was born I I was born in July of '69, and uh, I've actually got pictures of of me as a baby where my parents took me that summer. Uh, so I was actually I was actually initiated. Two week, two or three weeks after I was born, somewhere along there, and uh, All right. I can remember. All right. But the, the youngest I can remember going is when I was probably four or five years old. They used to have camera day uh, at the ballpark every year, and uh, I got to take my 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 biggest thrill was I got to take pictures with Lou Brock. He was my favorite player back then. And, uh, Whoa. I got people. Uh, I still got, I still the got story photographs the of me I, and Lou. I saw Lou Brock. I personally saw Lou Brock hit a home run, one of maybe four or five guys, into the yeah. center field bleachers yeah. in the Polo Grounds in 1962. It was the yeah. day that off Thronberry missed first and second base uh, yeah. in a doubleheader. Um, and then the Cardinals got Lou Brock, and he turned out to be a Hall of Famer. So, yeah. Great memory. Yeah, he, uh, he, uh, a lot of guys, a lot of these guys that's getting this big money today need to, need to pay, they need to go back and watch some films of him because, I mean, he, it didn't matter if it was a pop fly or a double or, or what it was, if it was a pop fly to first base. He ran it out because if that guy dropped the ball, he'd be on third. Well, that's just how he was. Right. He, hustled. Uh, he hustled. How is that not a good example of how the game has changed? Uh, yeah, I mean, even uh, which I know, I know Yachty. Yachty's been nursing. He he's nursed some injuries, but I got kind of aggravated that Yachty today. Uh, he didn't run the grounder out. And I was like, man, let's not start the year out like that because that was our right. big problem. I, that was our big problem last year was not running, not running stuff out and not hustling. And I think, uh, I think having Okendo back is going to make a big difference on that because he will, he will get on them just, I mean, he's a coach. He's not, he's not somebody just standing over there filling a position at third base. He, he uh, he'll bark at them if they're not running. Good, no excuse for that. And um, I think that's what made uh, the original Charlie Hustle in the slaughter uh, so, so valuable. Is that uh, he hustled? Am I right, Gene? Yeah, yeah. He, he, like a rookie year or something, he didn't run it out or something, and somebody asked him, uh, are, are, "Are you hurt or what?" And, he said no, and then he, after that, he ran everything out. That's the way the, you know the veterans were on the uh, rookies back then. I'll yeah. bet that reminds Al Blumkin of something Joe DiMaggio said to Yogi Berra. Yeah, yeah, Yogi begged off. I think it was 1949. He begged off catching a uh, second game of a doubleheader in Washington, where it was like like 100 degrees, and they lost the game by one run. And Berra comes in. He's joking. The was sitting there, sitting there, down on his feet, smoking a cigarette. And he, he look gives that look to Barra and said, "You're 23 years old and you can't play double headers." And Yogi never, uh, never asked out after that. Right. Well, uh, um, I got, I said I got a little. The real true superstars. Yeah. Pass on the tradition of winning in the locker right. room and how. Uh, we lose sight of the fact it's like fantasy baseball today. Players coming, signing, free agents. In those well, days, it was camaraderie and people in the locker room having each other's backs and they traveled together well, on the trains and they talked ball all the time and they stayed. Back, they came early yeah, and they stayed back, then, yeah, back in the 80s, uh, you know, during what, right? 
back in the 80s, back where, you know, what I call whitey, the whitey ball age for the Cardinals, uh, you know, them them guys was just as happy about getting a sacrifice of bunt as they as they was, you know, a home run, whatever needed. If if the team needed a sacrifice of bunt and that's what the guy done, you know, it didn't matter if he was your leadoff hitter or not. If they needed a sacrifice of bunt right then, that's what they done. And uh, you know, the team was proud of it. They all congratulated each other and you know, nowadays if if you got a, a guy that's all about himself and all about hitting home runs and you throw down the bunt sign, he just, you know, he wants to argue with the third base coach. And you don't well, do they that. don't know how to bunt. You do, you do what they tell you. Either that or they, they cut and bunt their way out of a paper bag. You know, that was, that was our first thing. Not, not just bunting. Just they can't the get the runner team. over. They can't hit the ball on the right. ground to the right side. And they well. can't slash won't because – it doesn't show up in positive stats that they they're exactly. able to take in to negotiate. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I remember a back. Horrible state. I just wanted to interject that they're talking about. They came out this week, baseball, the the about changing yet another rule to if a team is ahead in the last inning. They oh yeah, I heard that. Last inning. That's never going to happen. Change, was... You can change the order in which these guys come up. You, you, you take if the team is if, if you're trailing, yeah, that that'll never get through. Yeah, yeah, that's... it'll never get through. But there's a lot of things that just that they're throwing it out there. The, the union, the done. union, uh, uh, you know, got, uh, refused to approve this nonsense. Uh, by putting a runner on second base in the tenth inning of exhibition games, the union yeah, turned they, that down. They're not even going to do that. No, they're not going to do that. No. Okay, that well that's good. Sense. Because if you bastardize the rule book yeah. or the record book anymore, folks are just in on mass one day going to say, "This is crazy. Why do we do this? Why do why do we keep paying exorbitant exorbitant prices?" to go to a game with, that they're trying to speed up. They don't think enough of the game well, that that it's going to stand on its own, that people will sit and watch it, that they have – and they're telling well, you it's it's too slow, and yet we pay money anyway? I don't – How many – I think – How many great games are going to go – Pardon me? How many great games have been ended in, over, in, in, in overtime or extra innings? Have been I mean, no, I said how many teams? Them. How many games? How many game? How many exciting games have you seen in where they have, uh, where they have uh, uh, extra innings? You know, exciting ending to an extra inning game. Let me let me put it that way. Well, the ultimate was the. Many, it doesn't need any pepping up. The game. No, the, the ultimate was the, the game is. six in the '86 yeah. World Series. You know, the Mets and Red Sox. That was the ultimate ending in an extra inning game. Yeah. I like David Freese in uh, 2011. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I started, yeah, that's what I was fixing to, that's what I was fixing to get to recently for the Cardinals. 2011 has got to be one of the greatest World Series endings. And I was there in 64 at Yankee Stadium when the Farmer hit anyway. the hitting homer. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's because the Yankees brought in Pete Mickelson. Yeah, I know. We'll put Hamilton in. Yeah. Isn't this a great game? We can 35, 40 years have passed, and we're still talking about the strategy the, of what if and, and what have you. It's a wonderful mm-hmm. game. The memories are great. Um, Jerry, I want you to um, really have the floor a little bit and um, – Tell us a little bit about your life. Alrighty. Well, I was raised up. I was raised up in a in a small town called Clarkton, Missouri, and and uh, we, our town's got like a thousand, like eleven hundred people, and uh, 
it's a farming community. There's there's nothing around here but farms. Uh, our closest big city to us is Memphis, which is two hours away, or Memphis, which is three hours away. Uh, and like I said, I just got grew up and grew up and got married, and started a family, and uh, basically I've worked worked my whole life. I've always always had a job and and a steady job. I, I worked for I've worked for different places. I've done everything from working at John Deere to selling insurance to working in factory welding. Uh, and my re- most recent job, I was working at a place where in uh, I was working at a place where they build barges for the river. Uh, I didn't. I didn't build the I didn't build the barges. I, I worked at the fiberglass plant where they built the fiberglass covers that go on top of the barges. Uh, like when you cross the when you cross the river uh, and see these flat bottom barges that's got the fiberglass tops over the top of them. That's what we made. And okay. That's, um, that's where I was working, working with until that, I was working diagnosed. with that stuff is a, is a little iffy and scary. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. Uh, which I wore all my safety protection and all that, but I can't, you know, I can't prove it. But I, I don't know if it had anything to do with me getting cancer or not. But in 2000, in 2015. Uh, I had wor- I'd been working for two or three days with a really bad pain in my stomach, and uh, I sure we did it to kidney stones because I'd had had several of those, uh, and also my doctor, uh, my dad passed away. My real dad passed away when I was nine years old with pancreatitis, and uh, so I thought it might be that because he he played softball. He played softball in the local league, and he come home with a stomach ache uh, one night after a softball game. And the next morning, in the middle of the night, my mom had to take him to the hospital, so she rushed us to our aunt's house and took him to the hospital. And uh, he died, ended up dying. That was on Thursday night. He ended up dying Friday afternoon, so I never got to tell him bye. But uh, anyway, he... Uh, he died of what they call pancreatitis, and my doctor that I was going to at this time in 2015 and told me that I was borderline pancreatic, that I'd been having some trouble with my cholesterol and stuff. And so then I got to worried, thinking that's what it was, so we rushed to the hospital and had it checked out. And uh, they thought uh, they started treating me for diverticulitis, which is a bacterial thing if you're... Uh, colon and stuff well that, that that night I spiked a real high fever like over 104 and they ended up taking me to the hospital or taking me to the emergency room or to the operating room I'll get right here in just a second uh, and that's when they found out I had a stage 4 cancer they, they took I don't know how much they took out but they took out quite a bit of my colon and I had to wear a colostomy bag for about six months, and luckily they was able to reverse it. And then supposedly I was cancer-free after that. They they cleared me to go back to work, and I went back to work for about a month. Uh, but I had a I couldn't feel my feet, and I fell a couple of times at work. I had a neuropathy in my feet from doing the chemo. I took chemo for eight months. And uh, so they let me go and helped me. They told me I needed to get on disability, so they helped me get on my get on disability. I got my disability approved in less than thirty days with them helping me. And, oh, that's nice. So, I, so that I was on disability. It took so some burden on, off, I'll bet. Yeah, exactly. So I was on disability and started drawing checks. So I didn't really. I did lose a lot financially because I was making, which I, it's, it don't say it sounds like bird feed compared to what you can make in the big fact, the factories in St. Louis and stuff. But down here, I was making good money. I was making, I was making close to twenty-seven hundred dollars a month, and then, I, then when I dropped down to disability, I only I was only able to draw fourteen hundred a month. 
And so that put a pretty good chunk in my spending money, but I did okay and, and was able with the help of my parents to get my bills paid and stuff. Uh, but uh, I did okay. So I was like that until September. Uh, I lasted about six months. It was about time for me to go back and, and get checked with my cancer doctor. And uh, I started, I actually went back to the doctor for a cough. I had a real bad cough for about two weeks and couldn't get rid of it. Well, I went and I, I was full. Uh, my stomach was distended and, and full, and so they had me do a CAT scan and come to find out that my cancer had came back and got in my stomach. And now I've got I've got two or three big tumors in my stomach and uh, one on my back on my fifth rib that lays on my spinal cord. Uh, so it's very, very painful. And uh, I've taken, been taking chemo and radiation all this time, too. And uh, it just made me sick all the time where I couldn't take it, and I'm so weak. And basically the doctors had told me that that uh, my body's not strong enough to do anything else that would help me. Uh, and I made the decision, me and my parents and my kids had made the decision for me to stop taking chemo and have a better quality of life, uh, even though I may not last as long. So now I'm on hospice, and hospice is coming in, taking care of me, and I just, I need everybody's prayers. So like I said, I've really gone downhill. Uh, I When I was diagnosed back in September again, I had gained all my weight back. I weighed almost 220, and now I weigh 147. And, and so it's been been a pretty rough two years for me, but uh, I try not to let it get me down and try not to let it break my spirit. And well, it hasn't broken your spirit. That's my story on my health. Uh, I could tell that in the interview with Mark and Mark that it hasn't broken your spirit, and I just wanted to commend you for the courageous way that you're handling this and the fact that you're not blaming anybody or you're not angry with the world, and um, I'm honored to know you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Okay. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'm so honored that you're on, not just to know you, that you chose to come back to these airwaves and talk. Um, anything you'd like to tell your kids that you haven't told them yet? Uh, no, we, we, we've, uh, we pretty much made amends. Uh, actually, I, I made the, uh, I was worried, so worried about my kids having to go through everything. So I've already, I've already made my funeral arrangements and I've already bought my headstone and had it placed and picked, you know, picked out everything. Uh, all the, the only thing that I didn't get was the flowers. I, I let my, I'm gonna let my daughter and them pick out the flowers and stuff. But I've already got everything else done so they don't have to go through that because I've been through it with other people with, I, I went and sat there with my aunt and she didn't, my, my, my uncle passed away with cancer and she, he had cancer for a long time and they didn't bother to go make arrangements ahead of time. You know, well, at the time, at the time of death, you know, that's the time to be mourning. That's not, that's not a time to be having to go do a bunch of paperwork and stuff. And my aunt, I remember my aunt being so frazzled, she couldn't even remember how to, she didn't, couldn't even remember her, her own name, much less everything else that had to be wrote down. And one mom had to stand in with her and pretty much answer all the questions and not, I just, I don't want to put my kids through that, so I, I went ahead and I went ahead and done all that already. Uh, Jerry, uh, you're one mensch. I I know you don't know what that is, but that means a man's man. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that, buddy. Okay, I, my friend. Uh, um, I've made. I've made peace. I've made peace with God, and I'm just, you know, 
I don't know how many days I got left on, on this earth, but I just want to. I just want to live the best I can, and like I said, everybody, I've had, a, I've been really blessed. I've had three or four visitors a day, but I, I've had a lot of people, a lot of people come by and visit because they know I can't get out, and and you'd be, su- be surprised when you're struck with something like this. How you know how many people? You Jerry, this know. is one of the few times in my life I've ever wished know. I was in Missouri, so I could come yeah. by and say hello. Well, um, you're more welcome, and. And uh, I'll, I'll give you or the, any other I'll place in the south. By the way, you can come by. Not you just can come by and get some strawberry ribs. No. Oh. <laughs> um, boy, that that sounds good. Uh, no way you can make it out here to Alameda. Oh, I wish I, I could. I, mean, I, just, I wish I you wish could too, Jerry. Um, I can't travel much, but I we can definitely that. talk on Facebook every day, buddy. And we've been doing that, and it's been my pleasure to do that. And um, I want to thank you again. I want to thank um, Al Blumkin and Gene Hutmaker uh, for sharing your Friday with me week after week. It's, I can't tell you how how much I appreciate your company, both of you. And, Jerry, um, you, you're an honorary guest here. You have... Um, as long as you can, um, you call in on Friday nights and be part of this. We'd like you well, to do I that. Well, I appreciate that. That makes that made me smile. I, I appreciate that. I love okay, the, welcome to I the network. I love to talk to new people, especially about Cardinal Baseball. Beautiful. And we're going to put your name up uh, on the show page and uh, on the website. And I want to tell you, I uh, you're in good company, and also they're in good company. So well, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you can come back next week. You be here, be here if you can. And um, Gene and Al, thank you again. You're welcome. Right. Thanks a lot. Y'all have a good night. You too. You too. Okay. Take care. Should I good close night, it, Ralph? Good night, Gene. Good night. Should I close right. it, Ralph? Well, Cardinal Baseball, uh, comfortably zoned radio network. I loved doing this show. Okay, I'll close it. You close her up, Al. <laughs>